Okay, okay, here we are. Uh, welcome to the JS Core Dev Team Weekly Sync. It's August the 20th, 2018. Uh, I'm excited. I'm not sure why, but this is going to be fun, hopefully. Uh, cool. So, as usual, can we please have a note taker volunteer themselves for doing the note taking? Thank you, Jacob. That's rad. Um, you are a constant rock. <laughs> um, cool. All right, so weekly updates. Uh, so normally we go around and everyone uh, gives their weekly update, what they've been doing, what they've blocked on, and what they are looking to do this week. Uh, so first on the list is uh, Volker. Would you like to go? Hi, um, yes. So um, the first item is actually something from last week, but we haven't had time. Um, I've built a small script called DAG Builder. Um, so it takes a uh, text file as an input and then it builds up a DAG. So that's useful if you want to build some like more complex DAG somehow. Um, it has intentionally no documentation because I really want to change it quite a bit, but I thought it's a good backup to upload it to GitHub. So, so it's there. Um, but you would get the idea if you see it. It's pretty, pretty small. And then I did work a bit on graph sync and did some little p stuff, which ended in a par in, in, in a few um, pull requests, making the documentation a bit clearer because yeah, that just got started. Um, and I'm not logged. And next week, actually, uh, this is Thursday on, I will be in Tanzania at a conference, the Phosphor G conference, and I will be away till September 9th. So just for information. Um, so I will be somewhere in Africa, so I won't have internet connectivity. And yeah, so if you have any questions, ask them for Wednesday, else they will wait for another three weeks. All right, and that's all. Does anyone have any questions for Volker? Can I ask the DAG builder, what did you say? It was for like what? What would you use it for? Uh, so just so um, I needed to they need to create some complex uh, tags for graph sync and just to test out things and and it's clearly like super manual to basically build up your DAG somehow from command line and they just edit the text file and then it builds up the DAG. So the idea is basically for 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 testing and playing a found with stuff. So I guess it would have been useful for the IPLD Explorer. It would have been. <laughs> yeah. Cool, got you. OK. Um, all right, uh, Cheryl, is there any other questions? Cool, OK. Who's next on the list? Jacob. So last week, we did a release of Multistream Select that should prevent people from seeing the already pipes error. Um, so the root cause of that hasn't been identified, but it's likely we're trying to read when somebody has said we're no longer reading, um, but at least this should prevent the crashing from happening. Um, so if you see that happening, scream at me so I can figure out what else is going on there. Um, we got a release of libp2p to fix an issue that Alan resolved uh, with multi-adders throwing errors instead of calling back with errors. So that's fixed, yay for stability. Um, I've added a, a small fix for JSF IPFS API. Um, it was the way the HTTP and HTTPS modules were including request. It made it impossible to use knock for mocking out API, which I need for um, some upcoming work for delegate routing. So that's just a quick small change with how they're being required um, to allow knock to work properly. So the libp2p factory is ready to get merged. I think that's got all the, the green buttons. So hopefully we'll see that in the next release of JSI PFS. Um, I've got delegate peer routing all tested with libp2p. That's looking good. I found some issues with content routing that I'm fixing for the delegate. Um, I should get those finished today. So that should be in a good state um, for me to start working on an example for JSI PFS. 
Um, so hopefully I can get that out this week as well. And then we'll just be blocked on the go delegate routes being implemented. Um, I started implementing them in JSIPFS, but JSIPFS doesn't have refs yet. So that won't happen until that happens. Um, and then, yeah, I'll finish up the pure content routing. Um, I'm going to look into some JS IPFS repo um, configuration updates to help with the interop stuff we're working on, um, but we'll make sure those are backwards compatible. And then I'll also start work on the libp2p and libp2p switch state machine work this week. And that is it. Any questions? No, that's cool. Thank you, Jacob. That all sounds good. Um, I'm looking forward to a lip to p switch uh, refactor. Um, cool, shall we move on then if there are no other questions? No, good, okay, good. Uh, so who's next? Uh, oh, wait, that's me. Okay, so I had a busy week. Um, if you're on the all hands, I said some words about the, um, I, built a module for discovery and transport using libdweb, which is this uh, library for f uh, Firefox that will enable web extensions to do more peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, you should take a look at the video that is in the um, link from the hackpad. Uh, what else? So yeah, there was a whole bunch of places that I found that um, where the inputs weren't being validated properly, properly and that would have meant that the daemon would explode and crash rather than, um, so it, it meant that errors were being thrown while, rather than called, sent via the callback. Um, so that's good and that's sort of towards my OKR of having a daemon run for 10 days without crashing. Um, there was an issue with uh, object patch RM link, which I fixed. I can't remember. I, th I think that was because of dependencies, something in the dependencies changed in the patch version and the code in JS IPFS was using uh, stuff that was considered private, like it had an underscore in front of it. So anyway, the tests and master started to fail and then um, I fixed them up. So that's good. Um, and yeah, so then released, released JS IPFS again with those, with a couple of those fixes that I made uh, and then released it again with the data encoding argument that um, Alex had added for object get. Um, uh, what else is it? So create the PR to fix stuff. Right, so uh, the preload stuff. Um, turns out if you disable it, um, the IPFS node would crash when uh, you started it, which isn't great. So um, I fixed that and added a test. Um, so what else? Create a PR2. Yeah, right. So NPM publish was uh, publishing the disk folders in the examples directory. So um, it, <laughs> I'd previously run some examples and I created some dist, dist artifacts. Uh, and when I was hit, when I was releasing JS IPFS, they were also being published along with the, um, the, the, the code to NPM. Um, and someone pointed out that, uh, I think JS deliver was complaining that it, it, like when you downloaded IPFS, it was over 50 megs and it's because of the dist folders in the examples. So, um, I've just added a npm ignore to fix, um, to ignore the examples folder, because um, I don't think they need to be in the published package. Um, and that, that should help with the JS deliver thing. Um, and then, so what else was I doing? So I'm sort of half working towards 032 release and I've got mm, all but one of the pull requests that are going into that release um, in a state where we can just merge them. Uh, so that's good. Um, and then what else to do? Yeah, JS APFS API, I released a new major version of that. So that's got a fix for object.get, which uses the new data encoding argument. It's a, it's a major version because the Go IPF, it, it breaks compatibility with all the Go IPFS nodes. Um, you can't, you need to use 04.17 for it to work. Um, so not blocked on anything at the moment. Uh, next thing I need to do is to uh, release a new, yeah, so release new JS IPFS with the preload disabled 
fix in it that has gone green on CI, so I can do that now. Uh, and I need to get that IPNS PR um, into a mergeable state, which should, should hopefully not take too long. And then actually start working earnest on um, CID V1s and base 32 stuff, um, which I've made a few, a little bit of progress on already, but not enough. Um, so that's me. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Volker. Would it make sense to open the issue on what is now, now called like the test? report to say that basically we check all the ignore files of all projects because I could imagine that for example in the daily DTP we have a same issue where we basically check in the test folders. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess that is a good idea. <laughs> um, what do you say? Who will open the issue? You will open the issue? <laughs> I can open these you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Any other questions? Rad. Okay, moving on. Travis next, please, if you are here. He just popped out. Oh, uh, do I need to add him again somehow? Oh, okay, well, let's skip over him for now. And if he comes back, then we can go back. Uh, who go? Hi guys, so I just came back from a couple of weeks of vacation, so I didn't do pretty much anything. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about the next stuff. Um, I'll try to push a repo with some of the big data tests. Uh, I've worked on the last word. Um, and I'll, I'll continue this work, this work, and hopefully finish up everything until the end. And also give some love to my repos that probably need some cleaning up on the issues and pull requests. Uh, and that will be it for my next week. Awesome, thank you, Hugo. Any questions? No. Okay, uh, Alex, would you like to go next? Sure, so uh, I work with Al to get the data encoding PR in. Um, we talked about this a little bit already, just briefly what it is, is uh, in JSON all strings of Unicode. Um, when the uh, object is being turned into JSON by the Go daemon, it uses text encoding for the data field. Um, and that just spits out raw bytes, some of which can be invalid Unicode characters. Um, so then when you're trying to deserialize that from a string back into an object and then turn that property into a buffer, you get all kinds of rubbish um, and you can't, can't get the data out that you put in. So what the data encoding arg does is let you say, give it to me in base64 instead, which is safe to turn it into a string and then back out of the string. So that's cool. So we got that into Go IPFS. Uh, a while ago, it sat in their release queue and is now in 4.0.4.17. Um, so yeah, technically it does break backwards compatibility, but if you have specific types of data, then any version of Go before that will, will cause your JavaScript end to explode um, and just go, what is all this data? Uh, anyway, cool. So we got that in and that's great and that's been released. Uh, so then moving on, I fixed some problems with Jenkins. Uh, whereby that, that lovely Windows thing where you have like really deeply nested folder names in Windows goes, I don't know what to do with that, and just falls over. Um, so that was fun. So changing the build to actually be able to delete uh, node modules folders, deeply nested node modules folders. Um, I've been doing some profiling on JSIPFS, found a, uh, it spent an awful lot of time creating uh, JSON objects, or just objects that will then return from to JSON. Um, so what was uh, Volker to get a PR into um, IPLD DAG PB uh, to just do it lazily. So when uh, you are requesting the JSON object, then it will actually do the calculation if it hasn't been done before, uh, which is cool. Um, put a P another PR into Go IPFS to add uh, the parents flag to the write command so you don't have to create a directory before you write to a file in that directory you can just say parents cool like make derp um, so that's been approved but it hasn't been merged yet 
uh, and yes, you know, I wrote a bunch of tests for uh, uh, npm on J on IPFS, uh, which is great. So I'm blocked on actually deploying it anywhere because uh, the infrastructure team are trying to sort out some kind of you know uh, stable, reliable way of uh, spinning up arbitrary apps um, because lots of people need it and no one has it. Um, so now, because I'm blocked on that, I can't really do any more on that, um, which is a shame because it's one of my Q3 OKRs. Uh, so I'm going to park it and pick up the other Q3 OKR, which is basically looking at the HTTP API and uh, making it a bit more sane. Just trying to, you know, uh, like unify objects and DAG uh, APIs, that kind of thing. Um, and the fun bit will be like sticking GraphQL in front of that afterwards, which will be amazing. Uh, yep, that's going to be me. Any questions? If anyone's waving with their video turned off, I mean. Cool, cool. Okay. I guess Thanks, Alex. Um, can I just say that the change to DAG PB is what is the thing that was breaking JS IPFS, uh, but it shouldn't have been using the underscored properties. So it's not your fault at all. Uh, just my problem to fix. <laughs> uh, so yeah, don't use stuff that's private. Uh, <laughs> uh, kids. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so is, did, uh, did Travis come back? No, he's not, he's not here. Okay. Um, well, I guess you can read his update. Um, um, but thank you, Travis, for that. Uh, and does anyone else have any other uh, questions or comments uh, that they'd like to voice now, please? Sure, I'll, I'll just give a quick update um, on some of the stuff that I was working on. Um, so I implemented DAG JSON in JavaScript last week, um, waiting on a codec. Um, value in the registry, but other than that, it basically works. Um, and it solves some of the determinism issues by using a deterministic JSON serializer, uh, which is nice. But that is feeding into an RFC that we're writing, um, or that I'm writing up, um, basically just about how to encode links in different implementations. We've traditionally used these, um, these objects with a slash in them. And we still need to sort of reserve space for that. But ideally, these should just be CID instances, and it would make a lot of the APIs a lot simpler to use. So there's a PR to um, DAG Seabor to, to use this kind of form. Um, and DAG JSON already uses it. And this will kind of make its way into an RFC pretty soon, hopefully. Awesome. Um, could you put a link to DAG JSON in the chat for the notes? Uh, yeah, I'll just update the notes somewhere on there. Right, thank you. Yeah, it's it's currently on my on my uh, private GitHub or like I'm not private GitHub, my my personal <laughs> GitHub. Um, <laughs> it's not a private repo. Um, oh, it, in that vein, um, there's a couple issues that people might be interested on um, in the IPFS slash community repo. Um, one is just about sort of um, the blogs and Twitter and like different, we have like a million communication channels and we're trying to maybe create a new communication channel that could encompass everything. Um, and another one is a, um, a pull request to create a project lifecycle, um, which would basically call out kind of what levels of maturity that we think different projects are at. Um, so we have like 300 repos and <laughs> some of them are sort of softly deprecated uh, all the way to, you know, we're supporting this forever. Um, and we don't really have a good way to call that out or you can really be aligned on it internally. So um, I want to check that out. Nice. I think, um, I think Rob did a whole bunch of work in kind of categorizing the repos and at least adding labels to them so that we could tell what they are. So yeah, it would be cool if we could yeah. know what their kind of life cycle situation is as well. Yeah, yeah. This is like a, a slightly more detailed version of that. Rob gave a lot of feedback in, into this as well. Um, but basically, like we, we, especially as we start to spin up sort of community engineering and even sort of developer relations, we need a good signal to say like, this is ready for people's attention, rather than trying to push attention towards projects that were actually not really ready for that yet. Um, so there's a lot more work on kind of the earlier life cycle. Um, and also we need we need a different way than just saying deprecated to call out certain things like 
we we have we have projects that we are still actively using and supporting, but we know we want to move past. And so we don't want to encourage new people to adopt them if they don't have to, um, but it's not actually deprecated. <laughs> We're actively using it and supporting it. So we, there's some there's some stuff in there to try to differentiate. Like pre-deprecated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, DAG PB is like, we're using it. <laughs> like, we, we're literally fixing performance issues in it right now because we use it so much. But also, like, we want people to not use it for new things. <laughs> so that's like a hard thing to call out. Cool. Okay. Um, any questions for Michael? Uh, any other questions in general or uh, Machi or Mike, do you want to say anything? Yep, Mike. You're, You're muted. muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so I have a long-term kind of, uh, you know, month-long goal to create a demo app that I can use at the conferences and workshops and stuff. Um, that would basically, it's a, a Go um, libp2p, some kind of uh, daemon wrapper around Go libp2p that then would connect to a JS um, libp2, a browser-based uh, JS libp2p, and they would share a pub subtopic. And I'm just wondering, uh, is and I also am hoping to incorporate Rust uh, as a third peer in this uh, system. Um, do we know, is there any reason why that can't work, like the, a known uh, issue or anything like that? Yeah, I would, uh, I would talk to Travis a little bit about the work he's been doing um, with the testbed stuff. Uh, but the, I guess the biggest known issue is that JS IVFS doesn't have a DHT um, to, to kind of talk, to be able to kind of find content and stuff. I mean, Jacob, can you, Elaborate on that. Yes, so it will. We will have delegate routing, peer content routing at the end of this quarter. Um, so we should be able to to get some of that. Um, there's no reason we can't get the, at least the basic. If we're just doing lib P2P nodes, you're just talking about mm -hmm. just doing lib P2P nodes. Yeah, yeah there's no reason we should. Yeah. And the DHT I'm going to create in Go, and then they'll they'll talk to that. Sorry, go yeah. Ahead. So one of the things that we actually have slated for this quarter as well, um, which probably not going to get done just because blockers is the actual getting libp2p interoperability. So we don't know for sure what state that specifically is, but we know we have JS nodes talking to Go nodes, and that works. That's functional. So we have the ability to do it. It's just a matter of what surprises you might find along the way. Okay, good. Well, that will make it fun. <laughs> okay, so, th so thank you. No, that's, that's helpful. Um, I'll let you guys know how it, how it goes. Yeah, that would be right. I'd love to hear, I, I don't know anything about a Rust implementation of IPFS. I'm guessing that exists and is only of lib p2p is the parody uh, guys built right. a, um, a rust lib p2p so i'm going to try to do an all a no zero ipfs all lib p2p uh demo slash workshop uh tutorial thing and yeah obviously i've post all the code and and some docs around it so yeah, anyway if you, this want, is if you want to try it out rust. before then go like send it to me <laughs> i will i will try it out <laughs> okay all right thank you okay right um Cool. Does anyone have any other questions or anything to add? Oh, I have one more thing that I just remembered. Uh, the organizers of the Cold Front Conference just um, pinged me about having, they want something like an introduction to distributed web kind of stuff talk. Um, I'm not available to go to, I think it's in Copenhagen around that time. But if somebody else has a good sort of intro dweb talk that they're interested in doing, ping me and uh, we'll talk about it and 